Hey everybody, today I'll be taking a look at this two-handed longsword made by Dark Sword Armory. Specifically, this is a reproduction of the Andural Sword, as seen in the 2003 adaption of The Return of the King. Now, I like to dip into the history of the original swords of whatever my reproduction is based on, and this both has a lot of history uh, because it's a Tolkien object, uh, and he liked to write a lot of history about his uh, objects, his lore, uh, and also has no history uh, because it's a fictional item. So uh, I'm still going to be dipping into that little bit of history, and if that's not something you're interested in, I don't blame you. You just want to see what my opinion is and my experience is with the sword, then skip ahead to the time code below. I'll try to put some timestamps in the description, assuming that YouTube still actually supports that by the time that you see this video. Also, please note that I do not speak Quenya, which is the fictional language that Tolkien created for this universe, so I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce these properly, as that will just result in me butchering them. Uh, I'm not a lore expert by any means, so if you want to hear both better pronunciations and a more informed history, I recommend checking out the video that Men of the West did on Andural, which I will link in the description. So famously, Andural began life as the Shards of Narsal. Narsal was a sword forged sometime in the first age by the dwarves, and by the time it ended up in the hands of the ancestor of Aragorn, Elendil, at the end of the second age, it was already several thousand years old. Elendil carried Narsal with him while on campaign during the War of the Last Alliance, which was intended to end Sauron's invasion of Middle-earth, and this war culminated in a seven-year-long siege of Sauron's castle, Barad-dûr, and ended when Sauron himself came out to do battle with Elendil and the elf king Gil-galad. Sauron was able to kill both of them, and that broke Narsal in the process when Elendil fell on it, but Sauron was also mortally wounded in the fight, which gave Isildur, the son of Elendil, the chance to take up the presumably hilted half of Narsal and cut the Ring of Power off of Sauron's hand. This separated Sauron's spirit from his physical form, and that effectively ended the war and the Second Age. At the beginning of the Third Age, after Isildur was ambushed and killed at the end of the war, uh, the Shards of Narsal were passed down to his descendants uh, throughout the Third Age for nearly 3,000 years and finally ended up in the care of the elf Elrond in Rivendell before being gifted by Elrond to Aragorn as uh, the Broken Sword. Now, these shards were actually carried by Aragorn until shortly before the Fellowship departed from Rivendell to destroy the One Ring. There he had it reforged by the elves, and he named it Andural, which means Flame of the West. Now, Andural was carried by Aragorn throughout the remaining events of the Lord of the Rings, and along with that sword he was gifted a highly ornate magical scabbard which prevented the sword from taking any damage or any kind of tarnish. And presumably from that point forward, after the events of the Lord of the Rings, it went on to become an heirloom that was handed down to his descendants. I mentioned earlier that this replica is based on the Andural prop as seen in the Return of the King movie, and the events of the book around the history of the sword vary a bit from the movies. But one thing that I want to mention is that the sword design itself is not really mentioned in the books. The inscription on the blade, the magical properties of the blade, are, uh, but the actual profile is effectively left up to the reader's imagination. To that end, the prop designers of the film designed a medieval-style two-handed longsword with a broad blade tapering down to a point, which to me most closely resembles an oak shot type 16A, but with a fuller that runs nearly the length of the entire blade. Dark Sword Armory does appear to have patterned their replica pretty closely to the movie prop, with most of the variation that I could see between the DSA version and the film version being in the engraving along the blade. Ironically, those variations are the things that the book went into the most detail on, which is the seven star and sun and moon motif, which are missing entirely from the DSA replica. DSA's Andural is made of 5160 high carbon steel with a blade length of 36 inches, an overall length of 48 inches, and an advertised weight of a whopping four pounds. Now, before I get into performance and quality of the sword, I need to talk about 
the purchasing and shipping experience, which unfortunately factors into my overall experience and opinion of the sword. I placed my order directly with Dark Sword in June of 2021 and was given an estimated ship window of up to eight weeks. In September, I sent a follow-up to Dark Sword and I asked for an update. I was told that there would be another three or four weeks due to delays on the fittings, uh, which turned out to be true, uh, and I received my Endural Sword in late October. So order placed in June, received in October. Uh, so about four months from the time of ordering to when I actually got the sword. Uh, when I went to bring the box in, from where FedEx had dropped it off, I heard a loud metallic thump. Uh, I turned the box over and saw that the pommel and hilt were protruding all the way through the box up to the guard. Uh, when I opened the box, I discovered that there was almost no packaging inside of the box at all. In fact, the only thing that stopped the point of the scabbard from also going through the other end of the box was the little vinyl gift bag that they put in, uh, in the box that was at the bottom that kept the blade from going all the way through on the other side. And there was a small amount of plastic wrap with two little pieces of cardboard around the quillons, uh, but that was it as far as packaging goes, otherwise it was just a loose sword in the box. Unfortunately, the pommel did not survive the trip from Canada. It was really dinged up. Uh, I also noticed that there was a lot of rattle in the blade. I don't know if that was that way from the factory, or if just being bashed around in a warehouse and on a box truck floors ended up kind of loosening something up or breaking something loose. Uh, either way, I was pretty bummed out about this, especially after waiting for four months. Uh, it seems really ridiculous to me that a company that has been shipping swords to other countries for so long, uh, as long as Dark Sword has, that they wouldn't have thought to put any packaging materials in the box. Um, especially, again, considering the length of time that I waited and, and the expense of the sword. Uh, so I reached out to DSA's customer service, I let them know the packaging issues, and I also mentioned the rattle, and uh, they gave me a t return label. Now there were some issues that I also had with FedEx, or I should say that FedEx had with the paperwork that Dark Sword gave me, um, and I ended up having to be the middleman between Dark Sword and our local FedEx, FedEx office to get them to go ahead and pick up, or I should say accept that package and get it shipped out. And unfortunately, every FedEx office is a 30-minute drive for me. Uh, so it wasn't in any way a convenient experience. Uh, but that said, DSA's customer service was really responsive. They usually return my emails the same day that I emailed them, assuming that I emailed them during business hours. And if uh, if not, then it was you know often early the next day that I'd get an email from them. So really, really quick response time. They were very courteous and apologetic. Um, so didn't have any issues from them in that on, in that standpoint. Uh, a, a good customer service experience there. I just wish I hadn't had to have it over uh, a couple dollars worth of packaging material. Uh, so I received a replacement sword um, in just under three weeks from the day that I dropped the damaged one back at FedEx. And this one was much better. Uh, it was very well packaged this time. Everything came in undamaged and uh, also probably possibly most importantly uh, there was no rattle in this particular blade. I ordered mine as unsharpened uh, but I was pleased to see that for an unsharpened sword the edge geometry was already pretty good. It wasn't sharp per se. Uh, I couldn't cut with it but it did have a decently continuous grind coming from a rounded lenticular cross-section and a fuller that runs nearly the full length of the blade. Uh, for grinding the initial edge, I used my work sharp. I started with a medium grit belt. I didn't have to reprofile anything in order to get a good angle on it. It took an ed edge easily. I didn't notice any overly hard or overly soft spots along the length of the blade. So uh, really good edge geometry out of the box, even for an unsharpened edge. My first observation when I took the sword out of the box for the first time, at least the second one, uh, was just how hefty it feels. Uh, it balances really close to the guard. Moving the sword around, I get the impression that a lot of that weight is in the hilt. The sword feels hefty and feels like it has a lot of authority in the cut, uh, but I also get the impression that it's a bit sluggish as well because of that weight, especially compared to the other two long swords that I have. Now that said, I only have two other long swords, so I don't have a ton of experience and I have no actual professional training in the use of European long swords. So I'm not really sure how that compares to other swords that have similar blade profiles, but I do think we're dealing with a trade-off here between the handling performance and the movie authenticity, where we have this movie authentic, very large hilt, a very hefty hilt, but then a fairly slow moving blade as a result. 
The grip is partially leather wrapped. It's very snug and very solid. I'm twisting it and moving it around, it doesn't want to move or pull on me. The pommel has very smooth lines. It's pretty comfortable to grip. It's got this uh, sort of triangular, half triangular, rounded triangular shape. Uh, you just have to be careful not to bump your palm into it too hard because it's like getting hit with a hammer, especially with uh, those kind of triangular angles. Actually, I think if the sword were half-handed, it would probably make for a pretty good war hammer. All that said, cutting performance is very solid. Uh, the blade is quite rigid with enough profile width that I found clean cuts to be really easy to pull off. Uh, I was able to cut to Tommy Fine, water bottles, pool noodles. Pool noodles required a, a certain amount of speed that I have difficulty really getting and achieving with the sword. Like it, it needs almost kind of that pivoting movement whenever swinging through in order to actually make it through a pool noodle and not just bat it around. The severe taper point adds in thrust capability, but that also moves the cutting edge quite far from the point. From a durability standpoint, I nicked my cutting stain a few times, once quite hard, and I cut some green limbs, and I didn't experience any issues with edge dullness. I didn't have any deflection or rolling or chipping or anything like that. Uh, the leather, leather wrapping never loosened or moved. Uh, the guard stayed snug, had no rattle throughout. I did actually overswing to the point that I thrusted the tip into my gravel driveway, which uh, chipped the edge, but I was able to polish it out just fine. Now the pommel, according to DSA, is, and I'm quoting them, hot peened, heated, and pressure set, uh, which is a process that you can see in the pictures that'll flash up on the screen. I have no idea what all that entails. I assume it's similar to the peening done by KHHI on their Kukri's. It also looks like it's epoxied, I'm not sure. By their own admission, this is not considered as secure as a conventionally peened pommel, but I don't have enough first-hand knowledge of the process to know how much more secure a, an actual properly peened pommel is, or at what point the sword has to be pushed before that even becomes an issue. Now, they do have a new version of the Enduril uh, that was announced in January of 2022, which has a redesigned hilt with a pommel that allows for... Uh, proper peening. They describe it as their own interpretation of the Enduro sword, meaning it's not a movie replica. Uh, the blade to me looks identical. It just looks like the only difference is the hilt. Uh, the sword also comes with a scabbard. It is wood core, leather wrapped, and there are a few other options that you can get in addition to sword belt and sharpened or not sharpened. But the entry level price includes the scabbard. Now it's not the highly ornate version from the book that will protect the sword from any kind of damage. It is just DSA's generic uh, scabbard that they use across all of their swords that I've seen so far, which is fine. It's Those are well made. They don't look bad. So let's talk about price. I haven't mentioned it up until now, and that's because prices on everything as of this recording in March of 2022 are highly volatile. So any price that I give you now probably isn't going to be accurate by the time you see this video. In fact, when I bought the sword last year, I paid $780 all in. That's $725 for the blunt sword and scabbard, no belt, and $55 uh, shipping to me in the US. But since I bought that sword in June of 2021, the price has gone up to $775 for the same options. And that's assuming that they even continue making these versions and don't shift their production over to their new version. Uh, which they say is supposed to be available in May 2022. Uh, the price for the new version is $8.75 before shipping, so it's $100 more. Either way, this is not a cheap sword. We're there are certainly more expensive swords, but at $8.75, if you go with the new version, or $7.75, you are very thoroughly into Albion territory. So overall, I'm pretty content with the sword. I'm glad to have a functional Lord of the Rings sword. It's something I've wanted since I read the books when I was a teenager, and... I'm kind of glad I didn't end up just getting, a, you know, a cheap stainless steel version back then and, and waited and got something that would actually be uh, seemingly well made and functional. Uh, I wish that the shipping experience had been better uh, because that initial disappointment left a pretty sour taste in my mouth beyond that point. Although, again, I want to say that the customer service was pretty good. I'm not sure if this is going to be a sword that I'll return to frequently for cutting, just because, again, the handling I just find to be pretty pretty sluggish and pretty heavy. Hopefully, if you decide to get one, uh, they will put packaging material in it, and, uh, and it'll end up working out for you as well. So I hope you're all having a great week, uh, month, etc. I hope everyone is doing well, and I will talk to you later.